Hi, this is Miss Slitton, and this is my wonderful Period 3 AP Bio class. Say hi. Hi. And we are missing a few students today who are not feeling well, so I wanted to make sure we recorded this particular lecture. Now, let me talk to you just a little bit about why we're talking about this now, okay? So, we learned all about the functions of what? Proteins, Proteins that are in what? Where are the membranes. cell membranes? Perfect, okay? So, this, we're kind of throwing a little bit in here about hormones. Normally, as I went through body systems, we would get, you know, to the circulatory system, and we would talk about the nervous system, um, and we would talk about the endocrine system in sequence. But now, those are not mandated for AP Bio, yet some of the concepts that are in them are mandated. So we use these as illustrative examples of things that we understand about how membranes work. So that's why this is a good place for these notes. You are gonna also use these notes when we talk um, cell signaling, which I think is like unit four or something like that, when we do cell signaling, and you will use these notes in there as well. So the first thing we need to talk about is just the endocrine system. So when you look over, there are like the typical endocrine glands, like the thyroid gland or the thymus gland, the pancreas, testes, ovaries, but then there are other glands that people don't even think about that are also part of your endocrine system, like your stomach. Your stomach, yes, it digests and acts, it has exocrine glands in there that secrete pepsin to help digest proteins, but it also releases hormones as part of the digestive process as well. The key thing about your endocrine system Okay, its purpose is to coordinate the activities of your body along with the nervous system. If you were going to compare the nervous system with the endocrine system, which one do you think would work faster? Nervous. Nervous, nervous works a lot faster. But both of them help you maintain for the short term and also the long term. The endocrine system is more involved in those long term growth and development. Um, the nervous system is more rapid um, responses to homeostasis. So on your notes, the first thing you have is hormones defined and weird. Sorry, just one moment. Okay, it's auto hiding. Yeah, don't do that. Okay, so hormones defined is chemicals that affect the behavior of other glands or tissues chemicals that affect the behavior of other glands or tissues. Now, how do they do that? Hormones influence the metabolism of cells, growth and development of body parts, and homeostasis. Metabolism of cells, growth and development of body parts, and homeostasis. All right, and there are two kinds of glands that are in your body, um, exocrine and endocrine glands. And let me explain them a little bit before you start typing. Just, I want you to type with knowledge, okay? So an exocrine gland is like a salivary gland, and it secretes its substance into some sort of duct that's gonna go really outside of your body is where the duct is gonna drain into. So for instance, your salivary glands right here secrete saliva, which has a little bit of what's called salivary amylase in it, and it has some antimicrobial agents in your saliva, and it secretes it into your mouth. Now, it's still technically outside of your body, okay? I could have him open up his mouth, and I could put a tube in his mouth, and go to the back of his throat. I can make sure it went down his esophagus, not his trachea. I keep going down. I'm going to get a sphincter right there at his stomach. I'm going to get it to open up, and I will go through his stomach, out the other end of his stomach, poke into his small intestine, bunch of feet there, through his large intestine, rectum anus. And I could take that tube and go, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. okay? And what I want you to see there is technically, you're like, that's nice, Miss Litton. <laughs> technically, that tube is not in his body, it is out of his body. It's a passageway, if I had a real skinny arm, or if you ever watch Orville, that green blob guy, I forget what his name is, if you watch it, I could extend it and, and pass it through his body all the way and still technically be outside of his body. So anything he secretes
secretes into that tube would be an exocrine gland if it secretes into that tube, okay? And it would go to a duct and then a tube. You have some glands, like your pancreas is an exocrine gland. It secretes into the pancreatic duct, which joins with the bile duct and puts things in your, um, the beginning of your small intestine and your duodenum. And it also is an endocrine gland. And an endocrine gland secretes its chemicals into your blood. So if we had like uh, something, some sort of chemical that was released, generated, and it came out of those cells by what process? Exocytosis. And it then went into the fluid around those cells and then moved into your blood and then your blood would carry it somewhere else. That is an endocrine gland. Exo, exit, endo goes into your blood supply. Your pancreas is an exocrine gland and an endocrine gland. It is an exocrine gland because it's a playa in digestion. Your exocrine gland secretes, or sorry, your pancreas secretes pancreatic amylase. Remember I said your mouth, right? Salivary amylase. Amylase, ACE, it ends in ASE. What do you think it is? Yes. An enzyme that digests carbohydrates. Okay? It makes lipase. What do you think that is? It digests lipids for you. It makes another uh, couple of um, uh, uh, digestive enzymes. You have trypsin and chymotrypsin, and those, I just like to say it like that, digest protein. Okay? So it is a player in digestion and acts as an exocrine gland, but within the pancreas are these little they're called islets of Langerhan. I also like to put an accent on that one. An islet is a small, you know what an islet is? A small island. And it's little islands inside your pancreas, the islets of Langerhan. And they have two types of cells in those little islets, alpha and beta cells. The beta cells secrete insulin. What does insulin do? Lowers your blood sugar levels. So if you ate something sweet, like a Pop-Tart or something at nutrition, and your blood sugar level starts to elevate, the insulin will lower your blood sugar level, okay? When you're, if let's say you haven't had anything to eat yet today since dinner last night, then your pancreas could secrete glucagon, which will raise your blood sugar level. You know what they trace now a lot of heart disease to? Spikes in insulin. Why would you have a spike in insulin, a high spike? If you ate a lot of sugar, you do that a bunch of times, you will get spikes in insulin. You know what else you could get? Type two diabetes. diabetes, which is called maturity onset, which would be, you know, like if your mom, like I'm not saying moms do this, but if your mom, every time she talks to you yells, right? Pretty soon like she's yelling all the time. So yelling doesn't mean anything because she always yells. She's constantly yelling at you, right? So what do you do to those yells? You just what? Ignore them, right? If you live next to a, an, uh, a train station or you live next to an airport, after a while, do you think you're gonna hear the airplanes landing anymore? No, you start to ignore them. That's a normal part of our homeostasis is that happens all the time, so I don't need to worry about it. But if you have a friend come spend the night at your house and a train runs in the middle of the night, they're gonna be like, ah, it's coming to the house and be terrified because they're not used to that, right? So if you always have insulin getting released by your pancreas because you are always eating what kind of food? Sugar. Sugary sweets because you're a carb addict or a sugar addict, okay? I'm not pointing any fingers, okay? I'm not pointing any fingers, like, you know, kettle, pot, okay? But if you're constantly spiking your insulin like that, then that is what leads to heart disease. That is what leads to type two diabetes. It's not all the fatty foods you're eating, it's all the sugary foods you're eating. And pretty soon, what do we have on our cell? Receptors. Our insulin receptors start going na 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 na, and they don't listen anymore. And that's what causes problems. And that's what causes that heart disease, okay? It's all about receptors and chemical signaling, okay? There's a second hormone that the pancreas secretes and that's glucagon, okay? If insulin lowered blood sugar levels, what do you think glucagon's gonna do? Raise blood sugar levels if they're too low. And if you don't have any sugar to burn, what are you gonna burn? Fat. Fat. Sugar's just easier to burn. Fat is longer term. And if you're getting most of your calories from fat, you just actually don't get hungry as much. But if you're getting most of your calories from carbohydrates, you will eat something within two to three hours. What are you? Hungry. 
because you burn through the sugars like this, whereas if you're eating fats, it's slow burn. It's like having a hot fire, like if you went in your fireplace and you just threw a bunch of newspaper in there, it's gonna go poof, right, the newspaper, as opposed to a log that burns slowly and has energy for longer amounts of time. All of these are adaptations to our environment and the kinds of foods that we eat and our body is constantly trying to maintain what? Homeostasis, okay? So exocrine glands into a duct, endocrine glands, no duct. They're sen secreting something into your blood and some things are both exocrine glands and endocrine glands. So now go to your notes and go to endocrine glands, secrete hormones into the bloodstream via tissue fluid, not duct. Youngest bio buddy, tell when an exocrine gland is. The next one, exocrine is the next one. It's on your notes, it's all in there. Now, tell your bio buddy one new thing you learned so far today. Go ahead, tell your bio buddy. The, the, in, the, the inside of your body, but technically speaking, it's still the outside of your body. It's one passes away all the way through. So you can say the inside of your body is still the same as the outside of your body. Okay, now, I'm going to show you now two ends of the spectrum, okay? So cells, the only way cells can talk to each other, we have a whole unit called cell signaling that I'm trying to build, but there's no chapter in your book called cell signaling. It's gonna be a Frankenstein of several chapters that we kind of pull from, and we're already talking about it now. But cells, there's two ways they can communicate. Either they release a chemical, and another cell has a? Receptor. Either on the surface of the cell or interior to the cell. It has some sort of receptor, or one cell can what? Yeah, junction. You can have some sort of where one cell contacts another cell through a receptor, right? So you go actual physical contact of the two cells touching one another. We're going to talk about that, okay? But here, this is talking about chemical signaling. On one extreme, you have your endocrine um, system. And so you have some sort of gland that is generating, creating some sort of hormone, and that hormone is put into the blood. Why? Because it's your endocrine system, and that's how that chemical is gonna move, is through the blood. That, that hormone will go out and travel and be around other cells, but the way they, that cell reacts to it is if that cell has a what? Receptor for it. If you don't have a receptor, then it's like blah, blah, blah. You're not listening. Right? Just like I said about too much insulin and pretty soon your cells just go forget it. It's here all the time. I'm not even paying attention to it. Here, if you have a receptor, it can influence that target cell. What could it make that target cell do? What did you tell me? Or what did I tell you and you wrote it down? How do hormones affect their target tissue? Metabolism. Metabolism. What else? Growth and? Growth and there was something else development and what else homeostasis okay so that's how it will influence this cell okay that's one end of the spectrum the other end of the spectrum so these this is a distance right I could have my thyroid gland here but it could affect my quads right okay other end here these are neurons neurons are a type of nerve cell when nerves at the very end of them right here they have these things called axonal bulbs that kind of look like feet and neurons don't release hormones, they release what's called, if it comes from a neuron, it's called a, it's called a neurotransmitter. Okay, that neurotransmitter, when it gets released, will bathe this cell, and if it reaches a threshold, it will trigger an action potential in this second cell. The space here is like hardly measurable. You can't even see it like on an electron microscope, but there's a tiny little cleft, it's called a synaptic cleft, cleft and it releases that neurotransmitter and it binds to a receptor on the next neuron, which actually opens up sodium gates. Remember, the sodium what? And the only reason sodium would come in is if there's more sodium outside than in. And why is there more sodium outside than in? Because of the sodium potassium pump. It's pumping sodium out. So if it wants to trigger the second neuron right here, Sodium comes flooding in because it's going to go from a higher concentration to a 
lower concentration using a protein. So what would that be called? Facilitated, Facilitated transport. What got the sodium outside? Active transport. What allows it to come back inside? Facilitated transport. Do you see that? Check with your body buddy right now. Make sure they understand the difference. Go. Going uh, against the concentration gradient. It's either going with it or going against it. So then that, that creates either active. Okay, so this. This will trigger an action potential along that neuron. It will trigger an action potential along the length of that neuron, and that's how you will get information from this point of the neuron to this point of the neuron. And it happens really fast. Let me demonstrate for you. Take your hands, hold them up right here. Clap once, clap two times. Touch your ear, touch your nose. Clap three times, clap twice, clap once. We are not even on cheerleading. Did you hear us? I said clapping times, you're like, you got the rhythm. That was social pressure to conform with everyone else. Plus, you know, I would like, if you were clapping like, okay, clap three times, you know I'd call you out, right? Okay, so you figured out a way and you heard the rhythm of the room. But think, it's more amazing than, than that. Because right now, have your hands ready? Clap twice. Okay, let's think about what happens. I said clap twice and you're like, boom, boom, got it down, right? What happened is air is coming up out of my lungs because my diaphragm is relaxing and my ribs are coming down and it's going across my vocal cords and then my mouth and my teeth and you're making blah, 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 blah. And it's creating sound waves which are traveling through the air to all of you. Your pinna right here is directing those sound waves down your auditory canal going this way, hitting your tympanic membrane which is commonly known as your eardrum and it's vibrating due to the sound waves. That's all it's doing. I mean, it's a vibrating. Right now, your tips are vibrating, okay? It's vibrating. It then hits three bones of your inner ear, the smallest bones of your body, called the malus, the incus, and the stapes. The stapes is up against your cochlea and the oval window specifically, which is like a window that has like a, a plastic wrap on it. And so when the stapes hits it, it makes the plastic wrap go bleh. Blah, against the fluid inside the cochlea. So now fluid is moving, okay? Due to me talking, fluid is moving in your cochlea. It then has what's called another membrane, the bacillar membrane, who has hair cells embedded. And the hair cells are embedded in your tectorial membrane. So when the fluid, it's like a waterbed, the bacillar membrane goes up and down. Your little hair cells go up and down. And as they go up, because there's another membrane on top of here, the tectorial membrane, the hair is bent, that triggers an action potential in a neuron that goes to your brain that says clap three times. How fast was that? Think right now, go with me. Clap two times, clap once, clap three times. You see how fast that is? All of that happened, but I didn't even tell you the other half of the story, which I will now minimize. You received that signal because a neuron was implanted right here in your brain, in your like somatosensory area, and it says clap three times. You learned how to read as a child. Clap, clap, okay, three, one, two, three times, okay? It sent that information to the front of your brain, right here where your motor information came out, and then it had to go down through your spinal cord and to your left and right hand, and I didn't see any of you going, when I said clap three times, I got it, okay? <laughs> you all were able, do you realize you had to coordinate your hands and you had to coordinate at the right amount of pressure so it would make a clap sound. Because to soft, clap three times softly. Yeah, your rhythm was off, you know why? Because you couldn't hear the other claps to correct your speed, could you? Now clap hard three times. <laughs> See the difference? Your brain knew how to change how much pressure to put on your biceps right, and your pecs to pull your arms in so you would clap three times. You are flipping amazing, okay? Now, if we were out and we had to run an event, and right now your brain is like processing, you're kind of excited, you know why? Because your adrenal gland that's sitting on top of your kidney is secreting adrenaline. You're like, yeah, that's what I am so smart, okay? Because you're understanding it. And if we were like, I'm not on the football team, but if we were before a game, we might be like, ah, oh, like, and there's like war chants that go on. 
because you're trying to go back to your evolutionary brain as I have to defend the tribe. And I'm gonna defend the tribe, but okay. that ball is critical wherever that ball is. And then we've got people in the stands knowing how to play instruments like, go, kill the people, kill the people. I will play an instrument to cheer you on. And then we've got people on the side going, yes, you kill them, kill them now, yes, okay? So all of that is tapping into our ancestral brain that's going to do this fight. And you have to stimulate yourself to be like fired up and you do it all the time. What do we do before the quiz? Thanks, bio buddy, you're awesome. Oh, I believe in you. I'm trying to tap into your adrenal glands so you'll have a little bit of adrenaline which will then trigger the fight or flight response. Here's the beauty of all of this. The neurotransmitter and the hormone for fight or flight, endocrine nervous system, is the same thing, adrenaline, right? So that's pretty cool because the neurotransmitter, and in fact, there's another whole story about that, but I'm not gonna go into that. But I wanna tell you this other thing. Your adrenal gland, besides secreting adrenaline, it secretes noradrenaline. And you know what this is? This is anger. Have you heard people like, get mad? Have you heard of that? When they're getting like, they're gonna go fight or they're gonna run or they're gonna do something, if any of you have gotten shocked, like if you have a friend who likes to surprise you and goes, ah, and then you're like, ah, and then you punch them. <laughs> that is noradrenaline. Or if you've come home late and your parents were worried about you and they're all, hey, well, you know, I told you to get home. And, and you know what else? You've been doing this and you've been doing this and they're getting like spun up. That's anger, that's noradrenaline. Don't, don't tell them because they'll secrete more of it. If people have an anger management issue, they have a noradrenaline issue, right? Because that is coupled with the release of adrenaline and how you, um, you know, like if a mom sees a little kid and he's out in the street, she's like, oh, get out of the street. What were you doing in the street? That is that transition to having more noradrenaline. Those are all chemical signals. Okay, there is some similarity, but neurons, it's very quick, and you demonstrated that by how quickly you were clapping, and it's this neurotransmitter that goes across that cleft to trigger a neuron, to trigger an effector, which is, there's only two kinds of effectors, muscles and glands. You respond to everybody in your life with a muscle or gland. Okay, look at your bio buddy. Okay, look at each other in the eyes, respond, have an affect. How are you communicating with them? Muscles, right? You're, you're politely smiling, uh, muscles, <laughs> right? Talking is all muscles. It's pushing air across vocal cords. Those are all muscles, right? Glands, what do you do if you're hot? You Sweat, that's a gland. All of your responses, to everyone, when you take a test, you're responding with me with a muscle or a gland. That's it, every time. Because you're writing on a piece of paper and then those little funny things on that paper mean something to me and I read them, right? Okay, all of our responses. So neurotransmitters affect muscles rapidly so you can respond rapidly. Endocrine system is all about your glands, usually a little bit slower. Now in between that is what's called a neurosecretory cell. And a neurosecretory cell is something that, kind of like a neuron, because you can hear the neuron part of it, right? It's like a hybrid, and kind of secret, kind of like an endocrine. And so what neurosecretory cells do is it's a neuron that can secrete a hormone, okay? And an example of that is how your hypothalamus, which is full on nervous tissue, brain tissue, impacts your pituitary gland, which sits right below it. It looks like it looks like little mini testes in your brain. These things that kind of dangle down and there's two parts, they do. In a picture like when I show glands, they're like, no, oh, those are testes. No, it's your pituitary gland. There's two, there's an, obviously. Anterior pituitary and your posterior pituitary. Your posterior pituitary descends out of your hypothalamus from your brain and dangles down. Your anterior pituitary grows up out of your mouth and gloms on. And the pituitary gland is called your master gland and it controls every aspect of growth and development and homeostasis. This is your example of a neurosecretory cell. 
And so it's like a neuron, but it secretes a hormone. They're called releasing hormones, which then get your anterior pituitary to secrete stimulating hormones, which triggers a target. It's all chemical messages. Do you remember like when we played telephone across here? Similar, similar to that. Okay, so now what I want you to do is role play. Ping pong back and forth. Blue, you are in the endocrine system. Slate, and yes, I had to find paddles that matched it. You are the nervous system. And role play, I'm the endocrine system. I usually, meh, okay? Just go back and forth. Go ahead. Okay, now, on this, do you see where it says negative feedback? If somebody gave you negative feedback, you think, what would you interpret it out? Like, I'm giving you some negative feedback right now. What would you interpret that out? Bad, they didn't like, right? Negative feedback is self-corrective. What is the speed limit on the freeway? So if you look down and you notice you're going 80, what are you going to do? Probably slow down. Probably slow down by putting on the... Great, you're like, oh, I'm going too slow, 90. <laughs> so you would slow down to get it to 65, but if you look down and you're going 55, what are you going to do? Yes, this is negative feedback. It's, it's negative in that I'm in the wrong spot, i got to get to the right spot. I'm too, too, you know, either too much or too little. That's negative feedback. Positive feedback is amping and amping and amping. It would be like if I said, would you like a chocolate chip cookie? And you say, yes. And so I give her two. And then I'm like, oh, you're eating my chocolate chip cookie. Here are three more. Oh, you're eating my chocolate chip cookie. Here are four more. So she's like, okay, okay. And she's just shoving them in her mouth until she gets to this climactic moment where I've fed her 50 cookies and she goes, Bleh. right? That would be an example of positive feedback. And I'll give you some real life examples in a minute, but not it. Not Pass or play, do this slide right here. I got a good analogy. You know, absolute value. I think absolute value, but negatively and like positively. So it's like I like it. Whatever direction you're going from, you're going back to zero. Negatively. Yes, I like it. And then your uh, and then positive is going away from zero. Either way, either way. I like that. Okay, so let's let's look at an example of negative feedback, okay? Whoever explained the last one here, you hush hush, start here and work your way around and use this actual example of negative feedback. Go ahead. whatever that is, and if you are too hot, your body has to cool yourself. Some of you, when you work out, you are cheeks on fire. Like, you know those things, like, you know, whenever you go. Some people, they're blotchy all over. Some people, like, their whole body turns red. I'm either whole body red or blotchy, one of those two things. Why do we look whole body red or blotchy? What's trying, what's, what are we trying to do? 
blood to the surface. Like yeah, you're trying to bring your blood to the surface, right? So I can exchange it with the environment and cool off. Does that make sense? Okay. But when you are cold, what are some things you would do? Shiver. shiver. And not only would you shiver, but you would probably bring your arms in. Remember how we talked about that? I have less surface area exposed the to the environment. Yes. And then you have these little muscles called your erecti erector pili, which these t it's every hair on your body has a tiny little muscle connected to it. Can you believe that? And like if you, when you look at a dog and, he, and he's mad, you know how his hair stands up, right? So it's the same thing for you. The little erector pili muscle pulls on your hair so it stands up. And when the hairs stand up, it creases your boundary layer around your body because if the hairs are here, there's air in there between the hairs that is trapped. And so that will help warm you. You know this because you try to decrease your boundary layer when you're too hot. Take your arm, have your arm out, take your other hand and fan it over your arm. If you've got skin, it won't work if you've got a sweater, yeah. Does it feel cooler right there? Mm -hmm. It's because you're decreasing the boundary layer and so you cool off. That's why fans, not air conditioners, but straight up fans work because it's circulating the air, decreasing the boundary layer to give you a sense of coolness. So by getting your, by getting goosebumps, you're increasing the boundary layer, which then your air is trapped so your warmth from your body stays between those hairs and keeps you warm. Does that make sense? Okay, that's an example of negative feedback. If I'm too hot or too cold, I'm trying to get myself back. Positive feedback, a good example of that is childbirth, which I don't think any of you have experienced yet and should not experience for some time, okay? But when you're ready to give birth, what happens is, remember I told you the master gland was called the what? Pituitary gland. Pituitary gland. The posterior pituitary is what secretes oxytocin. I say it like that because it makes a baby come out. So oxytocin goes in your bloodstream. What oxytocin will do is it will go to your uterus and you can't like contract your uterus. There's no exercise to contract your uterus because it is controlled by what's called your autonomic nervous system, okay? But it will then trigger your uterus to contract. When the uterus contracts and there's a baby in there, it squishes them, right? Just like if you grab a tube of toothpaste, there's only one way out, right? Through the cervix. So what happens is the head then pushes against the cervix. When the head applies pressure to the cervix, it sends a signal, nerves, right? Detecting the pressure back to your brain. This is positive, a positive feedback. It secretes even more oxytocin, which makes your uterus contract even more against your cervix and so on and so on until the climactic event and not the but the okay <laughs> and what is also amazing about your bodies is the same hormone that makes the baby come out makes the milk come out and so that you and that makes sense because you want the milk to come out when the baby comes out so you can what yeah and when you first start breastfeeding after you give birth right Oxytocin is the out hormone. Prolactin is made by um, the anterior pituitary. It makes you make the milk, but oxytocin makes it come out. When the milk, when you first start breastfeeding after you've given, you go into like labor pains again because your uterus is doing what? Contracting because the milk is coming out. So you might feel like, oh, I'm, you know, I, uh, and you will have that, you know, and you'll know when you're doing that, if you have a baby, just go, it's just the oxytocin, this will pass, and it will. You won't feel that every time, otherwise I don't think very many people would nurse. Okay, so this is all positive feedback. So, not it. Explain, oh, you know what, that's not a not it one. Whoever explained this, you hush hush, because somebody else is gonna explain baby name. <laughs> Okay, so, so what we're seeing right here are ways of regulating our body and keeping us in what? Homeostasis. So this, this is one way is through positive feedback and negative feedback. 
There are many, many, many more negative feedback examples. There aren't as many positive feedback because basically what it's doing is if you were going, oh, I'm going 70 miles an hour, <laughs> then what would be next? I'm going 75. That would be positive feedback. Oh, I'm going 80. Oh, now I'm going to go 85. Now I'm going to go 90. Now I'm going to go 100, 150. Oh, crash. Okay? <laughs> that would be positive feedback, which would not be very positive, right? Okay? But negative feedback is, oh, I'm going too fast. I'm going to bring myself back down. Oh, I'm going too slow. I'm going to bring myself back up. Cruise control is what? Yeah, that's what cruise control is, right? Okay, good. Another way to do feedback, and this time we can nod it. Nod it. Okay? I have actually already explained this, but now you're going to see an example of how it is regulated. Go ahead, talk about this. I think you can manage it. So basically, there are two, two different ways that we make this work, right? There's, both, both of them are Okay, so you need your blood sugar level to be just right. So if you eat a lot of sweets, you're going to secrete what? Insulin. If you haven't eaten in a while, you're going to secrete glucagon to keep your blood sugar level exactly right. That's another way of controlling and maintaining homeostasis is using contrary hormones or antagonistic. I'm going to give you another example. Your thyroid gland. Your thyroid gland, one of its chief jobs, and there's two hormones to do that, is your metabolism. And that's how fast your machinery of your cells is working, right? So that's one, thyroid hormone. A second hormone is called calcitonin. And calcitonin will take, when your blood calcium levels are too high, a little bit elevated, calcitonin will lower your blood calcium. Where do you think it's going to put that blood calcium based on what you know about your body? Where do you store calcium? Uh, in bones. So it will put calcium into your bones, uh, bones. And the way I remember that is calcitonin it down now. Calcitonin. Okay, it's going to put it down. Sitting on top of your thyroid gland, four smaller glands called your parathyroid, like in association with your thyroid. Your parathyroid glands sit on top. They secrete PTH or parathyroid hormone. And you know what it does to your blood calcium? It raises it. And it takes it out of your bones and puts it into your blood. So between those two contrary hormones, everything is just right. Okay, think about it. When you're walking, right? right what's this muscle right here? Quad. quad. So my quad is going to contract, right? But I'm not going to walk like this. Right? I'm not going to walk like that. It's a slow change, right? Between using your quad and using your hamstrings, hamstrings right? Keeping everything just right so you can walk normally, right? You learn how to do that. It's keeping it. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I am going to talk about proprioceptors. So on your notes, go to your notes. So um, hor hormones and homeostasis. Compared to the nervous system, so now we're talking about hormones. It acts more slowly, but the effect is longer lasting. And then I gave you examples. I already wrote it all the way out for you, right? Negative feedback and positive feedback. You got that? And then antagonistic hormones are contrary. One says up. The other one says down. Exactly. Contrary or antagonistic hormones Hormones that have opposite effects. Now, whoever explained this, you hush hush. Other bio buddy, explain. I know the font got screwed up. Explain what's going on here, and relate it to something you learned this last chapter. Go ahead. This N is supposed to be up here. It's hypersecretion. The font just got messed up.
Okay, so hypersecretion is too much hormone. Hyposecretion is too little. Okay, so um, if you have your thyroid gland removed because it's cancerous, then you will hyposecrete, right, thyroid hormone. Does that make sense? Which will do what to your metabolism? Make it go down. Yeah, if you hypersecrete parathyroid hormone, which takes calcium out of your bones and puts it into your blood, then your bones will become very what? Weak. Yeah, and you could get bulging bones out because they can't take the weight and the pressure of your body on it. So there are diseases all related to hyper and hyposecreting, just like insulin, right? And osteoporosis, osteoporosis can it's come. Right? Yeah, yeah, and it's also related to a woman's menstrual cycle too. And that's why if you under eat, like if you're um, not eating enough food, you will end up slowing down your whole um, development of your menstrual cycle and having regular periods if you're not eating enough, like dancers and gymnasts and ice skaters sometimes don't have enough calories because their sport really puts pressure on them to be very what? Yeah, and then that will all give feedback to say, hey, um, don't do a menstrual cycle because you couldn't support a baby anyway because you're too damn skinny. And then as a result of that, that shuts down, part of that is putting calcium in your bones that's related to your hormones and your estrogen and your progesterone. So if you don't have enough of that, you can end up getting brittle bones as a result of that. And so there's like 16 year old girls who have the bones of an 80 year old woman and have osteoporosis because they're all linked in there together, okay? So hyper, hypo, hyper secretion too much, hypo is too little. All right, now, Whoever explained this, you hush hush, and other bio buddy, you should have no trouble explaining this diagram right here on how they work. Go ahead. So, remember, you can put hormones throughout your body, but they're only going to influence the cells that have receptors. Okay? They're only going to influence those cells that have receptors. Now, there are also other kinds of signals. Pheromones are when there's communication between different organisms. Like she could be releasing a pheromone that says, I'm in heat. And so he's like, all right. And so then he's going to come right over and try to, yes. Okay. Whereas I realized I needed to stop talking. Whereas hormones are between two different body parts. Pheromones are between two different organisms. So you could have a mouse that's in heat, a female mouse, she can secrete a hormone or a chinchilla, and that hormone will travel, and you could have a mouse two miles away going, what? And then he's running, because there is no second place, right? So he wants to get there first. So it's a way of having a chemical signal. Now, interesting enough, tying back into our unit, there, um, when it talks about love at first scent, what, what does that normally say? Love at first sight. sight. Okay. So this is what, this is what a little experiment that has been actually repeated. You know, it is, okay, good. I'm like, how is that charging? Okay, so this experiment has actually been repeated. Where they have had men in a binary world, this is how you could have this experiment. They have had men wear t-shirts for like a couple of days, okay? Not like working out so it's disgusting smell. There's other smells related to bacteria breaking down the sweat and that's why it stinks. But they're just their normal body odor. They take those, they take those shirts, they folded them up and put them in Ziploc bags and you know, labeled them one, two, three, four, no names. Then they took women and put men on stage and objectified them, like checked them out. That happens all the time. What do we call them for women? Beauty pageants. Right? Yeah, so it's okay because it's a beauty pageant, but you're like, you put men up on stage and checked them out, objectified them? Yes, that's what they did for the experiment. And so the men are parading about and the women are ranking them, okay? 
on whether they find them attractive or not attractive, yeah? Then later they go and, you know, separate from the men, they have them open up these Ziploc bags and smell the shirt, okay? And, smell, and they rate the shirts on whether they're like, oh, that smells good. And then I maybe I pass this to my friend and she smells it and she's like, oh, I threw up in my mouth, okay? So for her, it was not something she wanted to smell, okay? It did not match. Sight with smell did not match. What it was all about, remember when I talked to you about the major histocompatibility complexes in the immune system, MHCs, and there was MHC1s and MHC2s? Women were attracted olfactory-wise. Women, not olfactory, it's the neuron called olfactory. Um, <laughs> women were attracted to men who had different MHCs than themselves. Now, why would that be adaptive? The same, the same thing over again is probably bad for them. Not probably bad, but could be, yeah, inbreeding. It would take away inbreeding, but what else? Yeah. It's new genes. So new genes, so who would that be good for? Baby. My baby that came out due to oxytocin. My baby would have variety of genes which could possibly increase their fitness, their ability to survive and reproduce. You see that? So this is why. Now, I know people, I, well, I know one person. Actually, I think maybe two people. Their first kiss was when they kissed at their wedding. Good for them, that was not me, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> because I would have been terrified about those MHCs. You have to try them out, okay? I'm not saying, you go ahead, you wait till you get married and then have your first kiss. I'm all for it, I'm very, that's very noble, okay? But what happens is sometimes you might go out with somebody and they were fun and you're like shifting from the friend zone to date zone and then you go in for the kiss and you're like, mm. So it's probably because the MHCs were too similar to yours, and you're like, no. What do what do likes do? They no. What do opposites do? They attract, and it works with MHC. And that's like, no, they they were just meant to be a friend. Okay. So that's one. So these are chemicals, right? You're able to detect. It's not like you cut open their blood and you like mix blood and you figured it out, right? You were able. You smelt it on it. Just like dogs can smell fear, right? Because they can smell the hormones that you're releasing when you're scared during fight or flight. Okay, here's another one. Your menstrual cycle, if you have one, okay? So now, some women have the ability to draw their friends onto their cycle. Okay? I have that magic ability. Now, you will know this if you're in a household with sisters and a mom and everybody's on the you will all be on the menstrual cycle at the same time. Why would that be adaptive? You can compete for the best male and win because you're all on the same cycle, right? Now, coming back, that, that ability, it's not like, you know, it, you know, those are different places, you know, I, they're not coming in contact with the, and they might be, but they are not coming in contact with each other. And as a result of that, it's we're releasing a chemical that's saying come through my cycle be on my cycle and and then you you know people don't want to raise their hands but you know if you're that person because your friends get pissed at you like are you on your period because now i am and i'm starting a week early and you get mad <laughs> right that happens because periods are a pain and you don't want to be on your period and you're pissed if you're having your period a week early so and now think about dorms or whole floors are women, oh, right? Okay. Now, this is my most favorite example, though. Studies have shown that tears of women, like if I cried right here on you, will decrease his testosterone level. <laughs> How is that adaptive? How is that adaptive? Don't make me what? Right. I will lower your testosterone levels. You will not be fertile. You will not be fertile because you made me sad. 
Wait, so like cooties are real, basically? Cooties are real. <laughs> cooties, yeah. Cooties are real. So if you're in a partnership who somebody makes you cry all the time, I'm not saying that's your birth control. He makes me cry, so it's okay if I have sex without protection. Okay, I wouldn't do that. Okay. <laughs> But it does lower their testosterone levels, and men who make a bunch of women cry have lower testosterone. Maybe that gene won't be passed on, and they won't make any offspring. Huh? 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 Be kind. Be kind. Okay? Now, that is in your notes. You're like, where is that in my head? Okay? Look in your notes. Hormones are chemical signals. They can only impact those target cells that have protein receptors for that hormone. You see where I am? Hormones are chemical signals, number one. Can only impact those target cells that have protein receptors for that hormone. Pheromones are chemical signals that act between individuals. They are important in many animal species. And then I gave you some, the three examples. So, uh, girls, just carry around a jar of tears <laughs> and wield your influence. Be <laughs> God. All right. Um, walk out that door. Don't turn around now. That's right. I should have changed that look because you made me cry. <laughs> um, today we will go in as our favorite Disney character. I'll get you out of here, pass over any Jewish boy. <laughs> Favorite Disney character? <laughs> Asher. It did look Asher. Asher. I'm sorry. Woo, Tony. Oh, Tony. Damn it, Tony. <laughs> Tony, walk out that door. Walk out that door. You're still here. Let's go. Disney character. <laughs> what? Who's he hit? Hi, hi. Is that that? I talk too long. I'm not done yet, but I'm almost done. Okay. Yes. And then she would have to keep putting him away in the bathroom. Yes, I love Moana. I love Moana. Tell Bashan why should he be nice? What could how could you affect Bashan? <laughs> Women's tears will lower your testosterone level. That's what we do. I make women cry all the time. All right, here you go. Answer these questions. Oh, I'm going to show the questions so you can answer them at home. Okay, so go through and answer these questions. I'm going to bring them up. You could maybe pause it if you need a little more time. That's question number two. Here's question number three. Question number four, commit to a piece of paper so you can really test yourself. And question number five, Bashan, sorry, I'm recording for my YouTube channel, so that's going to be on YouTube. Sorry, I should have maybe told you. He was just kidding. He's very kind, helps me with my computer all the time. Let's go, Pumbaa. You're very Sorry. slow. <laughs> Thanos, let's go. Use your large hands and finish. <laughs> His chin is like... His chin. I think he has acromegaly. All right. Number one. Guys, should five of you be missing this? No. I'm going to geo two on you. Game of Thrones on you. Shame. Shame. Shane, oh turn towards your bio, buddy. Check them right now. Check them right now. Did you get that one right? Did you struggle? Shame. 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 All right. Fastest response time is always going to be what? Nervous. Right? Clap one time. Clap twice. Very fast. Hands. Da, 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 da. Uh-oh. Who... 
Who uses a hormone? Endocrine system. Who uses a neurotransmitter? Nervous system. Okay, I did give you one example where the neurotransmitter and the hormone were exactly the same. That is adrenaline, which is about fight or flight. Okay, am I gonna run away or am I gonna fight you? Okay, then it's one and the same. Number five, number five, good job. Tell your bio buddy, good job. All right, now, take a look here, okay? Hormones can act differently depending on the type of hormone they are, okay? This would be, a, there's several good essay questions that I've given you already in this chapter. Here's another excellent essay question, okay? So when it's a water-soluble hormone, a water-soluble hormone, is it hydrophilic or hydrophobic? Hydrophilic. hydrophilic, okay? Protein hormones are hydrophilic. Steroid hormones are hydrophobic. Examples of steroid hormones. From your huevos rancheros, what would that be? Testosterone. Testosterone, thank you, thank you, thank you. And then up here, what would be your, what comes out of your ovaries? Estrogen, Estrogen. Estrogen and progesterone. progesterone. Those are steroid hormones. Remember the adrenal gland where I told you about adrenaline and noradrenaline? Okay, that comes out of your adrenal medulla. And remember your, adrenaline, your adrenal gland sits on top of your kidneys. Around the outside of your adrenal medulla is called your adrenal cortex, just like you have a cerebral cortex, okay? Your adrenal cortex secretes three hormones. I bet you can figure out what they do when I just say them. You ready for this? A glucocorticoid. What do you hear in that? What do you think it's gonna do to your glucose levels? Raise them, okay? Mineral corticoid. What do you hear in that? Minerals. Think of a mineral that we put on our food all the time. Salt. salt. What would happen if I put more salt into my blood? What would follow it? Water. So my blood volume would go up. What else would go up as a result of that? My blood pressure. pressure. Okay? So glucocorticoids, mineral corticoids, and cortical sex hormones. Well, sex hormones, that makes me think of these and these, right? Okay? Those are your steroid hormones. You know your cell membrane is made out of what? Phospholipids. And so the, a steroid hormone can go right through and it will bind to a receptor. receptor. That receptor could be in the cytoplasm or it could be in the nucleus, okay? But it will bind to it and then it will, tr it will control gene regulation. What do our genes code for? We haven't learned all the steps, but we know the basics. Our DNA codes for our? Which then codes for our? Proteins. So steroid hormones like testosterone, which can be inhibited by? Tears. Tears, excellent. Okay, <laughs> then that testosterone is a long-term effect. It's not a quick effect, right? Whereas adrenaline, which is a water-soluble hormone, okay? Adrenaline, I told you, is associated with fight or flight. That's a quicker, you know, kind of a response. This binds to a receptor because it's water soluble. It cannot cross the, can't cross the membrane. And then it will trigger a signal transduction pathway. There could be some gene regulation here, or it might have an immediate cytoplasmic response. Youngest bio buddy, differentiate between these two examples right here, and you have 30 seconds to do so. Okay, now, I am going to show you a classic example of which you are slightly aware with. Remember we did all the protein functions, which is another good essay question. What, did, what was this? Enzymatic. And remember how we talked about cholera and adenylate cyclase? Do you remember that a little bit? Yeah. Okay. So here, here's where it is. And let me explain it to you. Here's epinephrine. By the way, epinephrine is another name for uh, adrenaline. Exactly, it's one and the same. You get an EpiPen shot because you're allergic to something? Okay, so epinephrine binds to a receptor. This receptor triggers a G protein. This G protein will end up activating adenylate cyclase, ACE, it must be an 
enzyme. Adenylate cyclase will take ATP. What does ATP stand for? Adenosine triphosphate. And it'll convert it to AMP. Any guesses what AMP? Adenosine monophosphate. So you know when we looked at ATP, it's like adenosine, um, which is adenine ribose, and then it's phosphate, 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 right? You with me? Yeah, so we have three phosphates out there. If you if two of them are gone and you have a single phosphate, it binds back with the adenosine, making a <coughs> cyclic AMP. You see? Okay? So that's cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP is known as the second messenger in the cell because it can trigger a series of events. Who was the first messenger? Epinephrine. Yes. Epinephrine was the first messenger, cyclic AMP was the second messenger, and protein hormones work like that. They stand at the door and knock, and they don't ever come in. Like if your mom was outside your room, right, and she knocked on the door and said, that room better be clean, and your friend, right, standing near the door says, oh my gosh, your mom said that room better be clean, and then you immediately ran around and what? Cleaned your room. Okay, that would be the effect. All right, um, who did s somebody explain this, right? Mm -hmm. Other bio buddy, here's that. Now explain it. I uh, yeah, it's just another diagram. Now, right here is showing you just the next part. Do you see where it says protein kinase A? A? ACE means it's a? And it starts a phosphorylation cascade where it's this triggers, this triggers, this triggers, like dominoes. Okay? It triggers and eventually it makes glycogen break down into what would glycogen break down into? Glucose. Good job. Glucose. Now, all of a sudden, the cell has a bunch of glucose. That glucose can be used in the powerhouse of the cell called the? To make more, so the cell can do whatever it needs to do. Okay, now, let your brain absorb this. This system is similar in all cells. So what's different about your cells? The receptor and then whatever, whatever products they're gonna make with their ATP. Grasp that, okay? You can use the same cellular machinery to turn on that cell, same cellular machinery internally, but what's different is different cells have different receptors, and what they ultimately build with their ATP is gonna be different because there are different types of cells, okay? Other bio buddy, you're gonna see it bigger now, go ahead. Here, I'll make it bigger for you. I'll make it bigger. And I'll move it for you. Okay, there you go. All right, so, okay, this is showing you this machinery can be the same, Re receptors are different, and what they do with their glucose is different. So go to your notes, action of hormones. Pepto peptide hormones are water soluble, and they have second messengers. Water soluble and second messengers. Fill in the blanks for me, you have the notes. Hormones bind to what? In the plasma, and they can't cross. Right. Binding triggers a messenger, which triggers a cascade of events. An example, epinephrine, epinephrine binds to a receptor protein in the target cell's plasma membrane. Binding leads to activation of an enzyme. What's the name of that enzyme first? G protein that activates another called adenylate cyclase that changes ATP into cy yeah, cyclic AMP. Good. Cyclic AMP is the? 
And cyclic AMP activates an enzyme that ultimately leads to breaking down into and becoming available to tissue. All right. Now, on this picture right here, you still have the second messengers, and this is a picture in your book, but now you've seen it four other different ways, right? Now, other bio buddy, explain this. These are steroid hormones. We have already talked about it, so this should not be um, new to you. And I will make a box so you can see it better. There you go. Okay, go. Other bio buddy. So steroid hormones effects are usually slower because they have to impact protein synthesis. So on your note, steroid hormones, lipid soluble and gene expression. The hormone diffuses through the plasma membrane because lipids dissolve into lipids. and it binds to an intra means within, intracellular receptor and it goes into the hormone receptor complex, acts as a transcription factor. You don't know what that means, but li just listen to it, transcription. Transcription is going from DNA to RNA. RNA. So it activates the thing that's gonna facilitate that and activates a gene, and ultimately a protein is formed. And ultimately a protein is formed. Okay, go. Let me show you the questions. Let me not show you the questions. I'll try again. Okay, so read it and commit to an answer. You got this. There's your second question. Go Aurora. Who's Aurora? Oh, my bad. Welp. Oh dear. Peptide water soluble hormones are received by a receptor in the cell membrane. They're in the cell membrane because they're water soluble, which means they are not what? Lipid soluble. So they can't go through the phospholipid bilayer. And then number two, which is a map question, steroid or lipid soluble ones bind to receptor in the cell and can impact protein synthesis. Only like half of you got that right. Check with your bio buddy and see where they went wrong. Okay, now, remember on the AP exam, they are not gonna divide it into units, right? So I'm at, there's no notes on this, but you might want to jot a couple things down if you want to. I'm, in a, I'm talking about receptors because we learned about them in our cell membrane, and then we applied it to the endocrine system. I want to show you a connection with the nervous system. I can't, we don't have enough time to learn all of the nervous system. I'm going to focus on just basically sensation for a minute. Here is a chemoreceptor. Taste and smell have chemoreceptors. For you to taste something, it ha has to bind with a receptor um, on your tongue. You have lots of different receptors, okay? T and smell is the same way. Um, mechanoreceptors are like proprioceptors, awareness of your body, those types of things are mechanoreceptors. Photoreceptors like would be in your eyes. 
Discuss with your bio buddy. Here are three different kinds of receptors. One responding to chemical, one re to some sort of pressure, and another one to light. Yet, how are these three receptors the same? Discuss. They all respond to stimuli, and then um, they all have ion channels, and they have the same Basically, the, the basic cell communication methods are the same. It's just a different stimuli. Did any of the signals enter the cell? Did any of the signals enter the cell? No. No. None of the signals. So they all triggered, triggered a what? First messenger, Anna? Second messenger. Who was the second messenger? Some ion that came in, yes? When that ion came in, it changed the membrane potential, which triggered an action potential in a neighboring neuron. Okay? So that inside the machinery was the same. Some ion has to come in. It's just what triggers that ion to come in. Here it has to be a chemical. Here it has to be a pressure. Here it has to be light. Do you see the similarity and the universality, is that a word? Universal. Universalness of the cells, the continuity of life, right? Is because the inside is the same. The only thing that's different is the receptor. Okay, next thing, taste, okay? I taught four years. For years, I talked about areas of taste on the tongue. In fact, I had a whole lab for it, okay? And we would go, oh, can you do this? They would say that sweet was on the tip of your tongue and sour was on the side and bitter was on the back. Totally not true. <laughs> They're all over. That was like a misguided experiment that just got propagated through every textbook. Also, there is a fifth taste, and that is you mommy. And that was made by a Japanese scientist, and it's the taste of like meat or savory flavors, okay, as umami. But there's no concentration of sour and bitter and salty and sweet. There is no concentration like that. Now, what I want you to see is right here. Here is salty, here is sour. Bio buddy, decide if you are the salty expert or the sour expert, and explain each of them, okay, Oldest bio buddy, did you decide? Explain each, and then like, how are they similar? How are they different? Go. Um, Okay, are you good? Okay, I gotta hurry up here. So here, when you're salty, what's the formula for salt? NaCl. So here's the sodium coming in, which then triggers what to come in? Second messenger, perhaps, okay? So now this calcium is activating, so these vesicles release a chemical, which then triggers a neuron that goes to the brain, okay? Over here, what's happening is sour, tends to be acidic, excess hydrogen ions, they are blocking calcium from going, I'm sorry, potassium from going out. Either way, it's the same thing. Whether sodium is coming in or potassium, which is a positive ion, can't go out, what are we doing to the interior of the cell? Making it more what? Positive, right? Are you with me? And that making it more positive also allows calcium to come in. Same system, just different triggering, right? Different cells, same system inside. Calcium comes inside, put your, snap, put your vesicles right here, and affect that neuron, okay? Neurons are gonna go to their destination, and it's all about, these neurons are very, very similar. It's just where they are in your brain. So if I went into his brain, his brain cannot heal. His scalp could, so if I cut his scalp and chip off his skull, he would feel that, so I would have to, you know, put something on him. But I could pet his brain and he would never know it. I could take a neurotransmitter and go, mm, and he could go, chow chip cookies. <laughs> okay? Even though that's not stimulating. That's why all those virtual reality things work. Because what are you stimulating? Your brain. There are people who've had their leg amputated 
but they might wake up from a nap or something and feel like their foot is itching. Do they have a foot? No, but the neuron that was connected to their foot is still here in their leg and somehow it got stimulated and it went up to its, your brain and your brain says foot itches, but there's nowhere to scratch. Okay, so that, a scratch here. So that is all that. Now, let me show you something else. The reason why it looks this is I did this illegally. I used my phone to take a picture of a magazine who had something really cool in it. So now I'm showing it to you. Look at this. Taste receptors are all over our body. We used to just think they were on our tongue. You have sweet receptors in your bones. You have bitter receptors in your lungs. And you have both bitter and sweet receptors in your brain and in your intestines. Guess what? We taste bacteria when it's in our body. And it's connected to our immune system. Look right here. Also illegally. Here's a bacterium. It was Scientific American. Um, and it's releasing this bacterium, AHL released. Oh, look, what's right there? What's that? Receptor. It's now binding with this bitter receptor, triggering, triggering the cell produces nitric oxide. Nitric oxide gets released and kills the bacteria because you tasted the bacteria in your body. Why? Because you had receptors. Thus endeth the lesson. I need two things from you. Lab, okay, eventually. I will put a clippy at your station. And I need your debriefs. Your debriefs need your 